Lesson 6 for February 3 through to 9, ready for teaching on February 10. The Marks of a Steward. Sabbath afternoon, February 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, on this day we come to you again. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your influence in our life. We thank you that you have provided salvation through the death of your Son, Jesus. And as we open your word this week, we pray that our responsibilities may be shown to us, but also that we may once again see your love expressed in your word. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Let's read that again, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Stewards are known by their brand or their distinctive marks, just as retailers are known by their logos or brand names. In fact, many people have become famous by turning themselves into marketable brands. A Christian steward's brand or mark is a reflection of Christ's love through the relationship that he or she has with him. When we live and practice the traits of Christ, our lives will reveal our brand. Our brand is his brand. Our identities are blended with his. As it says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. This week we look at identifying character traits of God's stewards that make up their brand name. These traits inspire us to look for Jesus' return and to do the work entrusted to us as faithful stewards of his truth. Each characteristic describes a deepening relationship we can have with the one who came to seek and save the lost. The more these qualities are studied, the deeper they will be ingrained in our lives. God's character of love in all its dynamics, will become our brand and have an influence on every aspect of our lives, today and eternally. Sunday, February 4. Faithfulness. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. To fight and win the good fight of faith, as it says in 1 Timothy 6, 12, is crucial for a faithful steward. Faithful is what God is and what we are to become through Him working in us. Being faithful means staying true to what we know is right, especially in the heat of spiritual battles. Spiritual conflicts between right and wrong, good and evil, will surely come. They are part of the fight of faith. The decision that marks stewards in every situation is the choice to be faithful. If you love wealth, be sure to remain faithful to God and what He says about the dangers of loving money. If you crave fame, remain faithful to what the Word of God says about humility. If you struggle with lustful thoughts, remain faithful to the promises of holiness. If you want power, remain faithful to what God says about being a servant of all. The choice to be faithful or unfaithful often is made in a split second, even if the consequences can be eternal. Question. Read Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 to 12 and 17 to 19 and Romans 4:13 and 18 to 21. What do these verses 
teach us about being faithful. Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 12. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19. The Faith of the Patriarchs By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. And Romans 4, verse 13, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And Romans 4, verses 18 to 21, Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. In Hebrew, faithful means to trust. The same Hebrew root gives us the word Amen or Amen, and it really means to be solid or firm. Faithfulness means we have been tested and tried, and still we have remained firmly committed to God's plan. Preparing to speak before the Emperor, the Reformer Martin Luther, as J. H. Merle de Bourguin wrote in History of the Reformation, Volume 2, Book 7, page 260, said, read the Word of God, looked over his writings, and sought to draw up his reply in a suitable form. He drew near the Holy Scriptures, and with emotion placed his left hand on the sacred volume, and raised his right toward heaven, swore to remain faithful to the gospel, and freely to confess his faith, even should he seal his testimony with his blood. Question. Read Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. This is to finish today. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. What should the words about being faithful unto death mean to us in our everyday walk with the Lord? Monday, February 5. Loyalty. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6, verse 24. What does this text teach us about the supreme importance of loyalty to God? Knowing that God's name means jealous, as it says in Exodus 34.14, should give us a clarion call for loyalty. Loyalty to a jealous God is loyalty in love. 
In the fight of faith, loyalty helps define who we are and encourages us to stay in the battle. Our loyalty is important to God, as we read in 1 Kings 8.61. Let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in His statutes and keep His commandments as at this day. It is not a contract that tries to foresee every contingency, nor is it just a list of rules. It is rather the visible expression of our personal beliefs, faith and commitment. Question. Read First Chronicles 28 verse 9. What does this text teach us about the importance of loyalty? First Chronicles 28 9. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of our Father, and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord reaches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off for ever. Where there is loyalty, however, there is the possibility of betrayal. Loyalty, like love, must be offered freely, or it's not true loyalty. Sometimes in war, frontline troops are forced to stay and fight. Otherwise, their officers would have them shot. These men might do their duty, but it isn't necessarily out of loyalty. That's not the kind of loyalty God asks of us. Look at Job. He did not foresee the catastrophic events that would destroy his family, possessions and health. He could have given up trust, love and commitment, but his loyalty to God was an unwavering choice of morality. Honest and unafraid to praise God publicly, he uttered the famous words in Job 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. His fidelity in the face of disaster is the essence of loyalty, and it illustrates loyal stewards at their finest. And so, to finish today, ask yourself, How loyal am I to the Lord who died for me? In what ways could I better reveal that loyalty? Tuesday, February 6. A Clear Conscience There are many precious things that we can possess. Health, love, friends, a great family. These all are blessings. But perhaps one of the most important of all is a clear conscience. Question. Read Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 22 and 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 and 2. What does it mean to have an evil conscience and a conscience seared with a hot iron? First of all, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Our consciences function as integral monitors of our outward lives. A conscience needs to attach itself to a high and perfect standard. God's law. God wrote his law on the heart of Adam. But sin almost obliterated it. Not just in him, but in his descendants. Only fragments of the law remained. As it says in Romans 2.15, Gentiles show that the requirements of the law are written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness. 
Jesus succeeded where Adam failed because God's law was, as it says in Psalm 40, verse 8, written in his heart. Question. What does Paul say is our only solution to a bad conscience? Hebrews 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Ellen White writes in Mind, Character and Personality, Volume 1, page 327 and 328, The cobweb closet of conscience is to be entered. The windows of the soul are to be closed earthward, and thrown wide open heavenward, that the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness may have free access. The mind is to be kept clear and pure, that it may distinguish between good and evil. End of quote. When God's law has been inscribed on the heart of the believer, as it says in Hebrews 8.10, and the believer by faith seeks to follow that law, a clear conscience is the likely result. Hebrews 8.10 reads, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So to finish today, if you have ever struggled under the strain of a guilty conscience, and know how terrible it can be, how it can be a continuous presence, never giving you relief. How can focusing on Jesus and his death on the cross for you and your sin help to free you from the curse of a guilty conscience? Wednesday, February 7. Obedience. Abel knelt obediently at his altar, holding the lamb offering as God had commanded. Cain, on the other hand, knelt furiously at his altar, holding the fruit. Both had brought offerings, yet only one brother had been obedient to God's command. The slain lamb was accepted, but the produce from the ground was rejected. Both brothers had understood the meaning and instructions regarding the offering of sacrifices, but only one obeyed what the Lord had commanded. We read about that in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through to 5. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. From the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 1109 of Volume 6, we read, The death of Abel was in consequence of Cain's refusing to accept God's plan in the school of obedience, to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, typified by the sacrificial offerings pointing to Christ. Cain refused the shedding of blood, which symbolized the blood of Christ to be shed for the world. End of quote. Obedience starts in the mind. It involves the delicate process of mentally accepting the responsibility of carrying out commands from a higher authority. Obedience stems from a relationship with an authority figure and the willingness to obey that figure. In the case of our relationship to God, our obedience is a voluntary loving action that moulds our behaviour to moral obligations. Obedience to God can be as specific as He directs, and not only as we think or desire it should be. The case of Cain is a perfect example of someone doing his own thing 
instead of doing what God asks. Question. Read John, 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, and Romans 1, 5, and Romans ten sixteen and 17. What do these texts teach us about the meaning of obedience to the Christian who is saved by faith without the deeds of the law? First of all, 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Romans 1 verse 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And Romans ten sixteen to 17 But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We don't obey to be saved. We obey because we already are saved. Obedience is the practical statement of a moral faith. Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel 15.22, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. And so to finish the day. What did Samuel mean by to obey is better than sacrifice? What should that tell us as Christians that could help us not fall into the false gospel of cheap grace? Thursday, February 8. Trustworthy. Question. Read Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through to 12. What does this teach us about being trustworthy? Why is this trait so important for a faithful steward? Luke 16, beginning at verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? This principle of trustworthiness is seen all through the Bible. For example, in one story, four chief Levite gatekeepers were entrusted to protect the Old Testament sanctuary at night. They were to guard the rooms full of treasure and to hold the keys to open the doors every morning, as we read in First Chronicles nine twenty six and 27. For in this trusted office were four chief gatekeepers. They were Levites, and they had charge over the chambers and treasuries of the house of God. And they lodged all around the house of God because they had the responsibility, and they were in charge of opening it every morning." They were given this task because they were deemed trustworthy. Being trustworthy is a characteristic of a good steward. This means that trustworthy stewards understand the deep significance of their roles. They understand that God is trustworthy, and they will aim to be the same. As we read in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright, is he. And 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. Trustworthiness implies a mature set of character traits. It is the highest level of character and competence that a person can achieve in the eyes of observers. 
reflecting God's character, means you will do what you say you will do, regardless of circumstances or people who press you to do otherwise, as Second Kings 12.15 said. Moreover, they did not require an account from the men whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to workmen, for they dealt faithfully. Daniel was considered trustworthy by the monarchs of two world kingdoms. His reputation throughout his life as a trustworthy counsellor who fearlessly delivered wisdom and truth to kings was in direct opposition to that of the court soothsayers and magicians. Trustworthiness is the crown jewel of ethics. It puts our moral principles on display in their purest form. This quality in a steward does not appear overnight, but comes over time by being faithful in even the little things. Others notice our trustworthiness. They respect us and depend on us because they know we are not swayed easily by opinions, fads or flattery. Being trustworthy is thus a demonstration of character performance in every responsibility played out on earth, the proving ground for heaven. As we read in Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 190, we are to be faithful, trustworthy subjects of the kingdom of Christ, that those who are worldly wise may have a true representation of the riches, the goodness, the mercy, the tenderness, and the courtesy of the citizens of the kingdom of God. And so to finish the day, think about someone whom you know personally who is trustworthy. What can you learn from that person that would help you be more trustworthy as well? Friday, February 9 Further thought. Another mark of a good steward is individual accountability. It has ever been, writes Ellen White in Early Writings, page 213, the design of Satan to draw the minds of the people from Jesus to man and to destroy individual accountability. Satan failed in his design when he tempted the Son of God, but he succeeded better when he came to fallen man. Christianity became corrupted. End of quote. With Christ at the centre of our being, we are open to his guidance. As a result, our faith, loyalty, obedience, clear conscience, trustworthiness and individual accountability will be revealed in our lives. Thus, as stewards, we are made complete in the hands of God, as we read in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Individual accountability is an essential biblical principle. While on earth, Jesus was individually accountable to the Father, as he said in John 8.28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. We are accountable for every idle word, as Jesus said in Matthew 12.36, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, as it says in Luke 12.48. The biggest threat to individual accountability, though, is the tendency to transfer our responsibilities to someone else. From the Testimonies of the Church, volume 7, page 177, I read, Let it be borne in mind that it is not our own property which is entrusted to us for investment. If it were, we might claim discretionary power. We might shift our responsibility upon others and leave our stewardship with them. But this cannot be, because the Lord has made us individually his stewards. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 
One, look at all the different marks of a steward we studied this week. Individual accountability, trustworthiness, obedience, loyalty, a clear conscience and faithfulness. How do these relate to each other? How would slackness in one area lead to slackness in the others? Or how might firm adherence in one area lead to adherence in the others? 2. Dwell more on how the promises of the gospel can help those who are struggling with a guilty conscience. What promises can they claim? And 3. We often view the concept of loyalty as good in and of itself. But is that always so? In what ways might it be possible to be loyal to someone or something that is not good? Why then must the concept of loyalty always be understood in a specific context in order to see if this loyalty is good or misplaced? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled The Stubborn Bride and it's by Andrew McChesney from Adventist Mission. Knock, knock. Alicia Athota, a construction worker, opened the front door of his house in Vanukuru in central India. Outside stood a man and a woman Elisha had never seen before. We want to ask you something very important, the man said. We want you to marry our daughter. Her name is Salome. Elisha was surprised. He wanted to get married, but he never expected to find a wife this way. Elisha spoke with the two strangers for a few minutes. Then he shook his head. I cannot marry your daughter, he said. Elisha explained to the parents that he was a Seventh-day Adventist and only wanted to marry a woman who kept his faith. The parents assured him that their daughter would become an Adventist. Elisha and Salome, pictured below, liked each other, and after a while the two were married. But after the marriage she broke the promise that her parents had made, Elisha said in an interview at the headquarters of the Adventist Church's South Andra section, with Salome seated at his side. Salome said she had been unconvinced that Saturday was the biblical Sabbath, so she kept attending her Sunday church. Her husband sank into discouragement. He didn't know what to do. Seeing his sadness, Salome began to pray that God reveal to her whether Saturday or Sunday was the true Sabbath. Around that time, an Adventist pastor showed up at her church. The pastor was visiting various churches in the area, passing out religious literature. The pastor gave Salome some literature and encouraged her to visit his church the next Sabbath. When she came, he began Bible studies that explained the difference between Saturday and Sunday. Five months after the wedding, Salome embraced the Sabbath. Today, she and her husband are full-time Bible workers. Elisha said he realises now the importance of following the advice of Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If your potential spouse doesn't agree to keep the Sabbath, don't take the risk of getting married, he said. Marry someone of your own faith. But if a mistake is made or something goes wrong, don't lose hope, he said. I really regretted my marriage decision at first, but now I am very happy, he said. Salome said she also was filled with joy. We are most happy about one thing. We are now able to teach the Sabbath truth to many people, she said. This lesson has been read by Dr. Percy Harold in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired. It is brought to you by the Sabbath School Department and through the services of Hope Channel. Remember, God is always faithful.